Website accessibility, why, when, and how. Accessibility is uh, very, very important because, uh, as Rick uh, wrote in the introduction to this topic, that one in six people in the, this region, at least, uh, need some kind of, you know, they are, they need, they have some accessibility need, and. Uh, if you spend thousands of dollars on building your beautiful website and is not accessible to some people for whatever reason, then you are basically you are building something exclusive, you are excluding some people and it's not inclusive. And that means you are saying, okay, I built it only for this group of people and the rest of you cannot enjoy my creative work. And whose loss would that be? Are we excluding those people or are you excluding yourself from their attention. So you are, you can exclude yourself also from the attention of uh, people at, you know, at wide. And uh, this is very important topic, uh, one of the topics which are close to my heart and uh, it needs people with passion to advocate, stand up and talk about this topic at every stage. And so we have Ricky Blacker from Australia. He, Ricky has uh, many hobbies, and some of those hobbies, his wife doesn't know, he says. So I'm, I'm going to disclose, <laughs> I'm going to disclose some of those hobbies. <laughs> so he's, he loves um, drones, and he loves uh, racing cars, and he's into music, production, and um, recording. So, and uh, he's into smoking meats and barbecues, and he really knows how to throw good parties. So here we have a person who's, who is enthusiastic about things like a child, childlike enthusiasm. You know, drones and uh, cars and recording. And at the same time, he's, uh, he's doing very responsible work at uh, WP Engine. Yeah, WP Engine. So he's got the knowledge, the know-how and the responsibility of running a very big, large company where people trust. Okay. So you, we have a person who's got passion and knowledge together. So Ricky, we are all here to share your passion and learn from you why, when, and how we can think about WordPress or website accessibility. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Before I get started, I want to just, can we get a big round of applause for Yogesh? And all the volunteers in here, please. One thing before I start, I just want to make, like, as you look around and you see all these volunteers working here this weekend, they're all giving up their time to help us have an amazing experience. So whenever you get a chance, say thank you, shake their hand, give them a hug, and uh, just appreciate that what they're doing for us. So just wanted to get that out there. Okay, let's get on to it. Um, website accessibility. Why, when, and how? I got it right that time. Uh, <laughs> so, who am I? My name is Ricky Blacker. Uh, my passions are WordPress. I love WordPress. Been <laughs> working with WordPress for quite a long time and telling everybody how good it is. I'm a musician. Love playing music. Uh, that's you know the thing that really keeps me centered and makes my life worthwhile. Apart from my wife. Uh, I'm a serial hobbyist, as we were discussing. Uh, we've got lots of hobbies that I do, and I keep collecting new ones, and my wife keeps saying, why? <laughs> you haven't got time for the ones you've got, but you keep collecting new ones. Uh, I work for WP Engine. I'm a partner and agent enablement manager, which is really hard to say, so we just call it PEM. Uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the things I do is help uh, people understand our platform and technology. So that's me. Um, but today, what I want to share with you is the three things. Why? Why is it important to implement accessibility in your web projects? When should you be implementing these accessibility things? And how? How can you do it? Well, I'm not going to show you everything, but I'm going to put you on the right track. But first, before we get started, I have a disclaimer the one and only video in my presentation. I just want to let you know I am not a website accessibility expert. Uh, I 
have been a web developer in the past, I work for WP Engine now. I'm passionate about accessibility. Uh, and just recently it got reignited and I really thought it's important to make people aware about accessibility and why it's important, how to go about it. But I am not one of those people who are really doing all the hard work of accessibility. So I just wanted to let you know that um, you know, when you're asking questions, I might not have all the answers, but I'll try and answer them all the best I can. So let's get started. Firstly, why? Why should we have accessibility in our websites? That's a really good question. One of the things I like to do is go to concerts. So I'm a musician, love to go and see other musicians playing music. Who, who likes to go to concerts? Yeah, hands up, yeah. So when we go to concerts, you see those people with the lanyards that say, access all areas. The ones who can go backstage, meet the band, stand on stage, do all their cool things, go anywhere. That's the dream. You know, if you go to a concert, you'd want to have one of those lanyards and go anywhere you like. But in reality, we end up buying a ticket and sitting in a seat or standing in a mosh pit. And sometimes, and this is happening quite a lot recently, sometimes uh, you might be sitting in a seat and somebody might be, you know, a couple of rows in front of you holding up a big sign. Now you've paid your money to go to a concert, you want to see the band, but you can't see the band because somebody is holding a sign up saying, oh, you know, I love you. <laughs> I don't get that very often, but some musicians do. <laughs> so, oh, hang on. We're not on the right one. Let me go back. Wasn't, I was looking at the wrong one there. <laughs> so with the access all areas, we want to have that access. But, yeah, we sometimes don't get that. And that's the same with websites. Um, we create websites and we want to show people all the things on the website and having them interact in a certain way. And as people who go onto websites, we know sometimes when you go to a website, you can't do all the things you want to do. You might want to do something, and, and for some reason, it might be hard. It might be, you know, like, it's, it's something that can't be done. For example, uh, if you ever go to websites with, uh, especially like like an airline, for example, and you go looking for the contact us, you know, the contact information, sometimes it's buried in a some weird page that you can't find. That's an accessibility issue. So when we're talking about accessibility, we're not just talking about making it ready for screen readers, doing all the things for you know to, for disability and. It's, it's about everyone, absolutely everyone, having accessibility to your information on the website. So the issue is, like, from a disability perspective, I did some research, and one in six people are living with some kind of a disability. So that's one in six of the potential people looking at your website. 650 million, and this was stats come from 2017. That it was intended to grow, so it's probably much higher now, but these were the, the last official stats I could find. 650 million people across APAC who could potentially have a reason why they can't access the information on your website. So that's one of the reasons that we look at accessibility, and unfortunately, it's probably the thing that most people fixate on. They think that they're just doing this for people with disabilities, you know, people with vision impairment, things like that. And there's a lot of things that you know, can be considered a disability for gaining access to a website. Mobility issues. If you've got, broke, unfortunately, broken both your wrists, for example, and you can't use your hands, you no longer can use a mouse to navigate around the website. How do they navigate? So you've got to think about all the reasons that people, you know, Besides vision, you know, colour blindness, there's all these reasons why people might not be able to see the website or be able to interact it, with it in the right way. So when we're designing, that's the, the main driver, but also everybody, and this is the part, is everybody needs to have access to the website. There's been times when 
I'm trying to do something on somebody else's website and I can't do it because while they think it works for them, it might not work for me. Another reason we might go into accessibility and do all these things is for legal reasons. So there's a lot of legal reasons why you might need to do this or want to do this. So certain websites do have a legal requirement to be accessible. So you need to look at, does my website have a legal reason? And what's the implications of not doing it? Can I be sued? Can I be fined? You know, can I lose accreditation? Uh, when we were talking about legal, there was actually a time... I mean, if you go looking for you know, legal cases against websites for accessibility, you'll find lots of use cases. In fact, there was, uh, there was one in um, Sydney, the Sydney 2000 Olympics, um, back in 2000, something like that. Uh, <laughs> And there was a person who sued the Sydney Olympics because they didn't have alt tags and uh, text on some of the images, which made it very hard for them to access the information on the Sydney Olympics website. They were fined, I think, $20,000. So that was quite a lot of money. It might have been 200000 A lot of money. So that was, it was a failure to provide text alternatives for non-text content. So that was, you know, like, there are hundreds of cases, thousands of cases like that across the world. Australia, a Asia, especially in the US. You don't want a website in the US. They, they sue over anything. We also have the economic reasons. So, what would be economic reasons for having accessibility? The more people who view your site, especially if you have a site that's generating income for you, or you know, leading them lead, lead generation websites, or yeah, WooCommerce stores, but anything that's going to be driving revenue to your business, if you can't allow access to everybody you're going to be leaving money on the table. If you have a brick and mortar store, there's a lot of rules around accessibility and you want to make sure your store is accessible. You put in wheelchair ramps and things like that to make the, sure that people can get in. You've got to make sure that you make your website accessible for everybody as well. So when? When do we need to start doing all of this? That is the big question. So, when we're talking about when we should be doing it, it should be from the very start. How many people here are currently putting accessibility into the websites? When do you start doing that? Do you do it at the very beginning, in the middle, or the end? And be honest. What I get from a lot of people is it's, it's at the end. You design the website. You do all the things. You make it look beautiful. You make it do all this stuff. And then you go, OK, now we're going to make it accessible. Whether it's because you want to, because you have legal requirements, you start doing it at the end. What happens at the end is you've now got all this technical debt. And then this is why it gets so hard for people, is because they wait till the end, and then they're like, oh, this is going to be really hard. Because now I have to go back and change things that I've already done, and I don't want to do that. So when you should be doing it is at the very beginning. When you're designing a website, start off by thinking about how can we make this accessible right from the start. How many people have been developing for more than 10 years? Hands up. So if you go back 10 years ago, and when I started developing, we just started getting mobile phones that could access the internet. Does everybody remember that? Remember before that we were playing Snake on their phones and all of a sudden we could actually look at websites? If you remember that, you also might remember the buzzword of mobile first. So we started developing and the, the idea was, hey, let's develop these websites so they look really good on, web, on mobile phones first, 
and then make them look really good for big screens second, and that way everybody on the mobile phone has a good experience, and people on big screens have a big, good experience, and everybody's happy. So we all started doing that. It was like, yeah, this is cool. So why can't we do that for accessibility? Why can't we go accessibility first? Look at accessibility. How can we make this website accessible to everyone right from the very start, and then make it look amazing for mobile phones, and for desktops, and 4K TVs, and smartwatches, and everything that we see websites on these days? Why can't we do that? So that's what I'd like to see everybody do. When you're designing, building, working on a project, think about accessibility first. How can we make this website as accessible to everybody? And I'm, once again, I'm not just talking about making it work for screen readers or you know, making sure that you have captions for videos, which is all important, but also, is this accessible for everyone? Can people navigate around this website easily? Can they find the information that they need easily? And then you make it beautiful after that. So how? How do we do it? How do we make websites accessible? So we're already starting at the beginning, hopefully. So we have the WCAG principles. So there's four guiding principles, or poor for short, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So, they're our guiding, and they are guidance. So you can use this just to guide you in making an accessible website, or you can use these for conformance. So conformance is when you need to be accredited. Maybe you have legal obligations, Maybe you know, it's for some, whatever reason you might need to get some kind of conformance. And there's different levels of conformance, which we'll go over shortly. But you could just use this just as a guide, even if you're not using conformance. So let's go through a couple of these guidelines. It looks like my notes are a bit out, out of whack, but let's, let's, let's try something here. So we have perceivable. And I'm just going to skip forward to the, first slide, the next slide, just for a second. Okay. We, oh no, it's all, it's all good, don't worry. <laughs> so, perceivable. Perceivable sets the standards about the way the website is viewed. How does it look on a mobile phone versus a desktop? We're going back to mobile first, but this is an important thing because if you design, the reason why we did mobile first is because if we just designed for the, for the desktop and not mobile, it looked really bad on mobile. So, we designed for the mobile first, that's part of accessibility. So when we're doing that, is it still readable on a mobile phone? Is the website easy to use and understand? Next one is operable. Operable looks at whether the user can access the website and find the information easily. Is the website or document able to be accessed by just the mouse or the keyboard? Can it be navig navigatable by other things than the mouse? So keyboard accessibility, enough time to get things done, being aware of seizures and physical reactions, things like that. So this is operable. Then we have understandable. Let me go back one. <laughs> Can the user get around the website or document using... Oh, hang on. Understandable. Have we got the right slide? No, we got we're out of whack. Don't worry. I'll <laughs> Understandable relates to the information and the operation of the user interface, which must be understandable. Is the information readable, predictable, and provide assistance? If inputting information, errors must be identified when inputting data and displayed on the screen in such a way ensures that it can be accessed. So that's understandable. One of the big things here, and we're going to come back to this later, predictable is one of the big things about this. And when I first learnt this, Predictable didn't make much sense to me. You think, what, what's, why is predictable important in accessibility? And when we're doing things, we're used to things working in a certain way. And if they don't work in a certain way, if they're not predictable, you might not, it might not work for you. 
A good example of this was I was filling out a form. There was a home show in Australia that we, me and my wife were going to go to. I want to get two tickets, sell free tickets. Just had to fill out some information on the, on the website. I went through, it said, how many tickets do you want? Two. Cool. Fill out this information. Name, age, you know, all this stuff for marketing research that we're used to. And then hit submit button. Hit submit, the form reset. No tickets. Tried it again. No tickets. Tried it again. No tickets. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what was going on. So if you're like me, when you fill out a form and you hit submit and, this, and the form resets, you think, I'm done. Give me my tickets. What was happening was because I'd asked for two tickets, when I hit submit, it cleared the form and at ver the very top it changed one little line of of text which said, person two. And if you didn't scroll up, you wouldn't see it. All you saw was the form resetting. So my predictable brain was saying, I've submitted, this form is reset, it's done. What they were saying is, please give us more information for person two. I wasn't predicting that. And they weren't making it clear. And so I didn't get my tickets. I did eventually figure it out and get the tickets. But you can understand how that can be a problem. And then we have robust. Let me just go to here. Yeah. Robust relates to compatibility. The website or document must be robust enough that it can be interpreted by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technologies. That is when a page is viewed on different user agents, such as mobile phones, braille readers, screen readers, text-to-speech. Everything can be interpreted. And this is, we do this as coders. We, you know, I remember like having mobile phones and different browsers open and checking a website to make sure it all works on that. We're used to doing that. So making sure that it's robust enough that it works with screen readers. And you know, we're doing it, making sure it works on mobile phones, making sure it works on big desktops. That's what robust is. Making sure that no matter what somebody sees the site on, they can, they can understand it, it works. And then we have conformance. So if you do have to get some kind of accreditation, you would need to go through conformance. Now, with conformance, if I go back, um, conformance is, there's three levels. Level A, if you need to get level A, you need to get all the level A uh, criteria ticked off. If you need level double A, you have to get all A and all double A, and then guess what? If it's triple A, all of the above. You have to get A, double A, and triple A. So getting triple A, obviously the highest level, and if you need to do that, you can use the WCAG or Web, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines to go through that process. So there's all the boring stuff out of the way. This is all the guidelines. This is all what you need to do. Let's actually get on to the practical tips. So design. Use high contrasting colors. Everybody knows that, don't we? I know this from a personal experience, one of the first websites ever designed. I thought it looked amazing. Everybody told me it looked amazing. And then one day somebody called up and said, I can't see any words on the screen. And I thought they were crazy. And I thought, I'm looking at the website, I can see the words. And this person said, no, I can't see any words on the screen. There's, there's no, it turns out they were colorblind. And I'm not the best color person in the world, and I was using dark blue on black which looked great to my eyes and to people with good eyesight. But with somebody with colour blindness, it was just a black screen. So that was my first lesson in accessibility. I then changed all of the text to white. Problem solved. Contrast. Use adequate, adequate line spacing. So what they recommend 1.5. So when, you, when you're spacing out text, try not to get it too close together. Especially for people, just somebody like me with bad eyesight. Um, text all running together can blur, make it very hard to read. Something simple like that is really good. This is one of my favourite ones. Use text, not pictures of text. What do I mean by that? Sometimes it's, well, a good example is just earlier, I had the video that said disclaimer. Now, if you did that on a website, let's say I had that video 
to say disclaimer, and I didn't put any alt text or anything around it, a screen reader won't read it. SEO won't read it. I actually had a, a customer once who I re had to rebuild her site because she had a sister-in-law build the original site for her, and they weren't coders, but she was an amazing graphic artist. So she created the websites in Paint Shop or Photoshop or something like that, and created these beautiful pages, beautiful text, butterflies, really amazing. I saved them as JPEG, put it on the site. So the whole site was a JPEG. And then she came to me and said, I can't get any SEO. Google does not see my site. And I went, yeah, that's because the whole site is pictures. And the pictures were image 10476. That's all that Google saw. No content. So when you're putting content on a website, if you use a JPEG or an image to relay that text and nothing else, SEO can't see it, screen readers can't see it, Pe people can see it, but some people. <laughs> so that's what, you know, using, if you do have to use a picture for text, make sure you've got alt tags and think descriptions, that kind of thing. Here's another important one. Don't use colour alone to convey information. So what do I mean by that? Think about traffic lights. Traffic lights, red, orange, green, red stop, orange go really fast to get through the lights, green you go anyway. Think about somebody with colour blindness. What are, what are they going to see? Imagine they've got really severe colour blindness. They're going to see three lights. So using those colours to display information for them is useless. I found out that colour blindness people actually, the traffic lights are universally in a, in a set order. It might be different for different countries, but in that country, I think it's universally, like across the globe, they're in a certain order. So when a light comes on, somebody with colour blindness knows it's at the top, it's stop. It's in the middle, it's, it's yellow, and it's at the bottom, it's green. So if we do that for websites, and somebody's got colour blindness, they don't have the advantage of knowing the sequence or knowing the code to do that. So if you're using colour alone to say stop, or some kind of a message with colour, you've got to remember that people, some people aren't going to see that as that. A good example, and I'm going to skip a little bit ahead, because I'm going to talk about forms later, but forms, once again, when we're doing forms, colour, sometimes we use red to say, change the text to red to say that that's, gone, that's not right. Somebody with colour blindness won't see that, so using colour alone can be a problem. Alt text and images. Alt text is there in case the image doesn't load. That's the original reason we had alt text. If the image didn't load, there was a, a description. Of course, we use it nowadays for screen readers, also SEO. SEO picks up on that, so it's very important to use alt text. We use WordPress. Well, I hope we all do. We're all here for WordCamp. WordPress makes it very easy to add alt text. So we need to use it. Does everybody use alt text? Yes. If you're not sure when to use alt text and when not to, because you don't always have to use alt text, if you go to W3.org, there's a really good alt text decision maker. It takes you through the process of what is this image? Is it decorative or is it actually relaying information that needs to be told about? You know? So you can use this tree or this decision maker to understand when to put in alt text and when to maybe mark this as decorative and let a screen reader bypass it. Form best practice, we talked about a little bit about the colours. So you know, making it predictable. I talked earlier about that form I filled out and it wasn't working because it wasn't predictable. With screen readers, making sure that the label's in front of the text box or the, you know, the box or anything that needs to be interacted with. If you put it behind, it might look really cool to design one with maybe putting the text underneath, but the screen reader's going to see an empty box first and then the description second, and it's going to confuse people with a screen reader. So make sure you use form best practice. I did see an article the other day that pretty much all the WordPress plugins, form plugins, have 
accessibility built in. So that's good, but you still need to have manual intervention. Make sure that you're setting them up correctly. There's also the WAIARIA, Web Accessibility Initiative, Accessible Rich Information Informed Internet Applications. <laughs> This is really good for putting in information, metadata around things, being able to show the screen readers and show you know, SEO and all that, different things about the website in a code level. So familiarising yourself with this is really important. Uh, it allows you to code things in and show screen readers and accessibility uh, devices how to interpret the website correctly. This is one... I was told to make people very much aware of. Beware of accessibility overlays. So I don't know if you've seen an accessibility overlay. There's plugins you can get for WordPress, and it says this is an accessibility overlay which will help with your accessibility. A lot of people think that adding this plugin or this system instantly makes your website accessible, but it does not. They do help. In some ways, they can put in buttons to make the text bigger, uh, add contrast and things like that, but they're not going to fix a lot of the problems we've already been talking about. Fixing your forms, um, you know, making everything accessible from the ground up. And we're seeing a lot of people using these overlays and thinking that their site's accessible when it's not. And even uh, I've seen <laughs> companies or you know, groups that are in the accessible, you know, in helping people with disabilities, and they're not accessible because they think they're accessible because of these. So be very careful. I'm not saying don't use them. I'm saying don't rely on them to do everything. And if you do all of that, <laughs> you will. Um, if you go searching for it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now I'm at times up, so I'm going to have to go through this really quickly. Video. Don't let them start by themselves if you can help it, especially if it's got sound. Make sure you've got controls to start and stop. Make sure that you've got captions if you can. Uh, all of those things. Thing, main thing is don't just let videos start with a full blast of music. <laughs> that really annoys people, and especially people with screen readers, because they're trying to listen to the screen reader and it's interfering. Don't test this yourself. When you you're doing a project, you always get people to check your work. Don't check your own work for accessibility. Get somebody outside of the project. If you've got a lot of people working on the project, get somebody outside the project. Even better still, go to a consultancy. There are a lot of accessibility consultancies out there who can check your website for you. Also train you on accessibility and do all those things. Which brings me to this slide. A massive thank you to Narelle Gaddy. Narelle was... Uh, did an we accessibility webinar from my company, and that got me interested back into accessibility. I did a course with her on accessibility to learn a lot of this stuff. Um, but she, I wish she was up here doing the talk, because she she's very passionate. She has a visual impairment, and her company helps other people put accessibility into the website. So when you are doing websites, and if it is really important, please use a consultancy if you can, or somebody who may be... Uh, have a disability like vision impairment and hearing impairments, mobility impairments, anything like that to test out the website in a way that you may not be able to and may not be aware of how the problems are. So quickly, in summary, we learnt why. Why should we be doing this? For lots of reasons. Not just because of disabilities, but because we want everybody to enjoy our websites. When? Get in from the very beginning. Don't wait till the end because you're going to have all of this technical debt and all these problems, and it's going to be too hard, and you won't do it. And how? There's all of these ways to do it. We've got the WCAG guidelines, but also just use common sense. Like, how do I access a website? What really peeves me off when I view a website and I can't see the information? Think about how you interact with websites and how you can make it better. And just quickly, before I wrap up, uh, in October, I believe it is, 9th and 10th of October, uh, there's the WordPress Accessibility Day. It's a 24-hour online webinar conference. I'm actually being invited to be one of the organisers this year, which I'm very proud of. Um, so if you want to learn more about accessibility and get, hear some great talks, keep your eye out for that in October. It's a long way away yet, but please remember it. And that's it.
Uh, thank you very much for listening to my ramblings. Uh, my name is Ricky Blacker, um, and I wish you all a very good WordCamp, and hope to see you all around at the, the place. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, now the stage is open for questions and answers. We have 10 minutes for yep. Q&A. Yes? I have got there. We talk about accessibility. We typically talk about people with disabilities. But um, I've also noticed that older people tend to have uh, difficulty in, you know, using websites, yeah. so does accessibility consider that? Or yeah, and that's what, I think that was the point I was trying to make. We, we focus on people with disabilities, and rightly so. We should be making the websites accessible for everybody, but we, we tend to focus just on like people with visual impairments and mobility issues, and hopefully we are. But we, we then neglect just general how to access the website, just for normal people. Uh, I, you know, those, examples I gave of were of me trying to access information on the website and I've got no disabilities, well, I probably have, but, you know, no, all of my hobbies is probably a disability, but <laughs> um, that's on my time more than anything. But, and look, I, I, I wear glasses and if I take my glasses out off or if I lose my glasses, I struggle to see websites. But even just normal, just people normally accessing websites on a day-to-day -day basis, we've got to make sure that they're accessible to everybody. We've got, to, we've got to focus on how easy is it to navigate. Can they get to all the information quickly and easily? And can they get the full experience without being hindered? And sometimes when we're designing, like I said, you, you're in the project and you know how it works because you designed it and it makes sense to you. But if you go outside of that and you get somebody who doesn't know the project, doesn't know the, the website, to test it, they might find the chinks in the armour that you didn't see. They, could, they might have... That's why we have user testing, because it allows us to get somebody else to see outside of the box, outside of what we're seeing. So, yeah, we have to look at all the aspects of accessibility. Hello, Ricky. Very good talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have a question in regards to sometimes when it comes to, say, uh, the needs of, say, a business to design a website and maybe even especially small businesses, they have an opinion on how they want to present their brand and they have an opinion on how to, you know, um, say they have already a brand book or they have a logo or something like that. How do you approach the conversation of we do need to design accessibility first when they may have an opinion on what they want the website design to look like or interact or, or, or be interactive like, like they have an yeah. idea. Yeah. And that is the big thing. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of the issues is they, um, it comes back to like, when do you bring in the, the, the accessibility and also how far do you go? Um, I think if you've a particular brand and you've got dip, you know, a certain way you want to show your website, but it's not accessible, is that, you know, is it really doing you any good? Because there are, I mean, I've, I've had conversations with people with disabilities and they've had trouble accessing certain sites. And people, here's the thing, as website owners or designers, we assume everything's okay because people are viewing our site. How many times when you go to a website and it doesn't work for you, do you go to the person who owns that website or to the company and say, hey, I couldn't access your website? We don't. We just go to the next one. Because there's hundreds of websites out there and a lot of them are doing the same thing. So whenever we'd, we come up against a barrier, we don't say to somebody, hey, can you fix this? We just go look for something else. So where a lot of these brands might have you know, their look and their feel, and they, that's the way they want to be. But if they're losing customers because of it, because they'd rather have that over accessibility, they may not know that they're actually losing customers. 
And that's, I think that's the point. We, we don't know how many people aren't, you know, when people are walking past a store, is it walking, are they walking past because they don't want to shop there or because they can't shop there? Hi, Ricky. Hi there. That was a really good talk. Thank you. I felt like it was very accessible. I'm, I'm glad. I tried to make it, make it as accessible as possible. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest questions I have, and it's very important, uh, and I hope you can answer it very honestly, how did you find a wife that bought you a drone? I'm trying to get my wife to buy me a drone. <laughs> she doesn't want to have anything to do with it. I don't think that's very an accessible partnership. I, so how would you deal with that? Well, it wasn't very smart on her part because she was already complaining that I had too many hobbies and then she bought me another one. So do I need more hobbies? You need more hobbies. Excellent. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> okay, when, uh, I have a question for you, yeah. Ricky. So... Um, when we talk about accessibility, when you do the compliance at the end, the companies can put one line in their budget, accessibility compliance or accessibility audit. And so they can say $150, $200 or $300. But when we go through the whole thing about uh, building with accessibility right from the start, then we are talking about one uh, extra person on the team or uh, extra time, and that increases the budget. How do we convince businesses to spend a little more for time for accessibility, the budget impact. Of that. And that's a big thing. It, uh, and when I, I probably should have elaborated that a bit more on the economics side when we talk about why should, you know, where's the, what's the economic thing. There's, there is also a negative, obviously, if you're spending more time working on accessibility, if you need to bring more people in, more consultants, if it's going to take you longer, there could be a negative impact on it. But then what is the positive, you know, anything we do, there's you know, a positive and negative. Uh, and okay, yes, we might spend, especially if we start from the very beginning. Like I said, if you start from the very beginning, it's probably going to cost a lot less than waiting till the end and trying to retrofit accessibility into a website that's already not accessible. If we're starting at the very beginning and working towards the goal of accessibility, it's going to be a lot cheaper and it's going to be a lot better. Also, once again, like I said, you've got all these people that you may not even know aren't viewing your website because they can't. They're not telling you that. And so you're losing, you know, for, for a brand, um, you know, they're losing customers without even knowing it. And also it's good, you know, in this day and age, we want to be accessible. So it's good if a brand can say, we have gone to the trouble, or a company has said, I've gone to the trouble of making this website accessible and please let me know if it's not because I want you to access my website. So it's a positive image as well. So I think the impact, the, the, the positives, even though it might cost you a little bit to start with, I think the positives way outweigh that cost. Any more questions? Any questions? So uh, I Thank you, Ricky. Now, uh, we can see Ricky is really good-looking, handsome man. <laughs> but when we hear him talk, we hear his passion about this topic. <laughs> and he's very knowledgeable. So thank you very much. And uh, no wonder they call him Mr. WordPress in Australia. <laughs> Am I right, Robert? Is that what they call him? Yes, <laughs> Mr. WordPress from Australia. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Yogesh. Thank you. I'll give you the money for, for saying how pretty you know, good-looking I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.